Happy Sabbath, Church. Today's scripture reading is found in Psalms chapter 73 and verse 26. It says, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now welcome Melissa Oliveri to the pulpit. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. It's always a little tough getting up here. <laughs> Um, I, I heard this sermon by David Ashrick, and I wanted to share it with you. It's about having doubts. It's something I struggle with. I'm not sure if everyone else does, though. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this day, that you, the Sabbath day that you have given us. We want to thank you for gathering us together. We pray that you forgive us of our sins and forgive the sins of the people that we're praying for. We, I pray that you speak through me, Heavenly Father, and that you touch the hearts of the people in this congregation. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. So um, when I was a little kid, my third grade teacher called me the question queen because I asked so many questions. It did not change as an adult. I still ask a lot of questions. Lately, honestly, I've been asking God why. I feel like everywhere I turn, either someone is sick, someone has gotten hurt from an accident, or family members at a very young age have died. All I can think of is, why God? Why is this happening? God, why weren't you there to prevent this and protect us? I've always wondered, is it okay to doubt God? Is it okay to ask him these really hard questions on why these things around us are happening? I listened to this sermon by David Ashrick that showed us that it's okay to doubt God those real, uh, to, and ask those really hard questions. God says in Isaiah 118, come, let us reason together. God is big enough and secure enough that if you're mad at him, he can handle it. If you want to argue with him, it's okay. He can handle that too. Let us turn to Psalm 73. That's where we'll be at today. Um, it, it's a great example of what David Ashrick calls holy doubt. When we talk about doubt, we also must talk about faith as well. Faith does not offer or require absolute certainty about all things. Faith is a journey with God and toward God. Um, so when I was doing this sermon, when you think of uh, the Psalms, who do you first think of? David, right? Yeah, this was not written by David, and you'll see. <laughs> and now when I, look, when I think of the Psalms, I'm definitely going to not think of just David. <laughs> but Psalm 73 is written by Asaph. In this Psalm, he doubts the faithfulness and even the reality of God. Asaph was a Levitical priest. He was a man of God, and even he doubted. Um, I know when I, when I read Psalms, I sometimes miss the true meaning of it until I read it a couple of times. So I'm going to ask Angelica to read it for me, and then we can break it down together. Angelica, can you read Psalm 73? Yeah. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My step was nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance, they have no more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak lossfully. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongues walk through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and the waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. 
Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awakens. So, Lord, when you wake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hands, and you will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to your to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my proportion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for half thoroughly. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Thank you, Angelica. Okay. So, 73.1 says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. This first verse tells us that the, how, how the universe is, how it's supposed to be. I don't think anyone here would disagree with this. This makes me think that if you do good things, then good things happen. But this is not always true. A good example of this is Job. He was considered God, by God a righteous and just man for his time. Yet he had to endure difficult trials. He even questioned God in Job. I have to do my next one. Okay. <laughs> Job 13, 23 and 24, it says, He says, How many wrongs and sins have I committed? Show me my offense and my sin. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? His friends, on the other hand, questioned his behavior and what he did wrong. Job's friend Bildad says in Job 8:20. Surely God does not reject one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. There's also the story in the New Testament. John, now we're talking about Jesus and his disciples. John 9, 1, uh, 1 to 3 says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, the Israelite thinking, as well as our own thinking, is if something bad happens to you, you must have done something wrong. Yet Jesus shows us that that is not always the case. Let's go back to Asaph. Asaph must have had a, dis a disease or a struggle with his body because he mentions little hints in this psalm. It must have been a personal struggle. On um, 1314, I mean 7314, it says, All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning bring new punishments. And 20, verse 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He goes on to write about his envy of the wicked because they have no struggle and they prosper. Yet another indicator that Asaph must have been sick. 4 to 12 says, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and they speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Again here, Asaph mentions how they don't have any struggles. Their bodies are strong. They even mocked God and appear to have no repercussions. The, ba the wicked can basically do anything and prosper. Do you feel like that sometimes? Do you feel like everyone is around you is doing well and you have all these trials going on? You want to cry out and say, God, I've been so faithful to you. What is going on here? 
Asaph felt that he was being oppressed and all the, be uh, the wicked were being victorious. We know, unfortunately, that that's not true. We live in a sinful world so that everyone suffers. Psalm 73, 13 says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, and I washed my hands in innocence. Asaph provides this verse, and I think it really encapsulates what we feel as Christians sometimes. We think, what is the point of doing things the right way when, we didn't, when it didn't get us the, what we wanted? We think our walk with God is a two-way street. We act a certain way, we keep our hearts pure and our hands clean, and God makes things easy for us. We tell ourselves that doing things the right way means in a just world that things will go right for us. The truth is, when things go wrong, we realize the motive behind our walk with God is less about loving Him and our relationship, but often we use Him as a way to get what we want. We doubt when things go wrong, and we thought we were doing it all right. Verses 2 and 3 say, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph was very autobiographical here. He was very honest. He said, I almost threw in the towel. My feet almost slipped. When my body was racked with pain, I almost gave up. He was very transparent. Again, this is a Levitical priest, a man of God, who's saying, I can't do it anymore. You don't have to raise your hands, but who here has thought of the doing the same thing? You might have thought, the burden is too big. The confusion is too big. You're too tired, and God is just not listening. This was your time of doubt. You did not have absolute certainty of what's going on in this world, and you were tempted to give up your faith. Asaph, in Psalm 73:15 says, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. Sometimes we need the faith and testimony of others to carry us through our doubts and struggles. We need each other. We also need to share our doubts and our struggles. If we're not honest and open with our own struggles, nobody else will be either. If we can't be vulnerable to share our struggles, then how will we know what is truly going on? We need people to share their struggles and show how God truly helped them. Honestly, this is why we say our prayer request and how I like it to, we say our prayer request. We can see what is going on with each other, even if it's a little glimpse. In our prayers, we can share how God answered those prayers. 16, verses 16 and 17 say, When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. We see Asaph do a 180 here. The whole psalm shifts at verse 17. When Asaph entered the sanctuary of God, it became clear to him how God gives him hope and joy. It shows how Asaph recognizes how the only true person that can help him is God. When Asaph entered the sanctuary, he was plagued with doubts and even uncertain about God. But when he came out, he was singing praises to God. So what happened? He shows us what happened when we read on. It's not, it's not what he encounters, it's who he encounters. Verses 25 and 28 say, Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing I desire, desire beside you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Asaph had a close encounter with God. His soul experienced a peace, it seemed, to have never known before. Here he began to discern the larger plan of God for man. From God, he received a totally new perspective on life. He began to see things in the light of eternity. Asaph was looking at things at a temporal point of view. His eyes were open when he was close to God and saw that the temporal things will pass away, but God is always there. This has always been my struggle. I get a little tunnel vision and I see things in a worldly view, not in an eternal view. 
a lot of the times I feel like I can handle it myself. I say, God, I, I got this. <laughs> I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will expand my view to know that it does not matter what happens here on earth because these things will pass away. But if we serve him and we obey him, we will live with God forever. The book... The book Deliverance in the Psalms by Hans K. Larendell says, self-confident boasting people are not walking on solid ground. Their happiness is unstable and unreal because it is based on the creation, not the creator. It goes on to say, there's no consecration to the Lord. Celestial joy is a state of the heart and is rooted in God. The things of earth cannot satisfy the deeper longings of the soul. Verses 18 and 19 say, Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. Again, the, the book Deliverance in the Psalms by Hans K. Larendell says, Asaph began to see the triviality and flimliness of materialism. With prophetic cer certainty, he now announces the end of the superficial pleasure seekers in Israel. If he's at, as if he stands at their funeral, he bewails, how suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. So verses 20, 23, and 24 say, they are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Here note that Asaph writes, you hold me by my right hand. Not I hold you, but you hold me. He also writes, I am always with you. He knows that God will guide him. And again, the permanency of God in, is in the psalm when he says, afterward, you will take me into glory. 25 and 26, verses 25 and 26 say, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength strength of my heart and my portion forever. Can you see how much Asaph loves his father in heaven here? He notes that he does have a bodily struggle, but God is the key uh, verse key in this verse. It shows how Asaph's view has changed and now he does not see things in a worldly view, but his view has changed to eternally. When we have our struggles and we have our doubts, we need a but God clause in our lives. The but God clause in our lives will show us that God is always there for us. When we have these doubts, we have to go to the sanctuary like Asaph and allow God to change our point of view. We, like Asaph, can sing the praises of God. The book uh, Deliverance in the Psalms by Hans K. Larendell says, the believer needs to encounter the living God personally. By faith in God's promises, the Spirit of God can communicate to us God's love, the certainty of our adoption into the household of God, and the new hope for the future. Asaph ends his psalm by saying, and this is verses 27 and 28, Those who are far from you will perish. You, dest you destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. How wonderful is that? The Ministry of Healing, page 182, <laughs> says, Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels it's nothingless and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. By prayer, by study of his word, by faith in his abiding presence, the weakest of human beings may feel in contact with the living uh, Christ, and he will hold them by hand that will never let go. I, I want to end with this. My cousin from Italy was reading a devotional and shared this with me. It says, our response to life's painful situations demonstrates the level of trust that we have in God. 
This is true for our lives and those of our children. God has told us many times that he allows the trials to perfect us and to make us more like his son. Trials should not be dodged or avoided because they must be endured to learn the lesson. Asking God the right question in the midst of a trial is an expression of how much you trust in him. The question should not be, how will I get out of, or how do I get out of this? But rather, what will I get out of this? By changing the how to what, you show off your dependence on him to teach you and also your willingness to learn. When you have your struggles and your doubts, go back and read Psalm 73. And remember, Asaph had his doubts, but in the end, God was his savior and our comforter as he is ours. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for being with us. We want to thank you for all that you do for us. We want to thank you for guiding us and being with us through our trials and our struggles and our doubts. We pray, we want to thank you just for everything that you do for us. Um, we pray that you will continue to be with us, and we pray all these things in your holy, precious name. Amen.